Poppy. How are you guys doing in the material department? Good. It's not as it's not as um, like difficult as I thought it was going to be. So that's nice. Like as long as I'm, I read through it, it's pretty easy to understand. Okay. I like it. Yeah, I like it a lot. It's okay. so much better than a big old textbook. Oh, definitely. Can you write that on rate my professor for me, please? Of course. <laughs> because I'm like, right you know, I'm like trying to push through because I'm like, you know, I'm I'm in the I I do medicine, right? I do muscle and bone problems, and, and so I teach. I work with patients all day long, and I come from a massage perspective, and I get just so often I'm like, medicine is not that sophisticated why do we use those science classes as weed out classes and make you read these big old books when it's if you you know massage the information and i work through it it can be delivered in a much easier format so that's my mission <laughs> how are you guys with the uh talk about that because with with that kind of approach comes also, the lifestyle assessment thing, the water drinking, the medi, the water, the walking kind of thing, uh, and then those exercises. Are you guys okay with doing those? Yes. Okay, good. Because that way, we're kind of trying to bring back sort of into the body what, you know, what we're learning. And it's not just in the head. You know, that's kind of what I try to do with that. Did, did you guys, some of you get through um, the uh, food label analysis yet? No, not yet. Okay. Yeah, that's a little bit early because we're just, what I want to do is today is I want to go through, you know, the, I think the introduction chapter and then the chemistry chapter. I think that's the cutoff for today. I'm not totally sure. Hold on. If you guys know, let me know. Where did I have that syllabus of mine? You guys have a syllabus? I have yeah, I do. Hold on one yeah, second. Yeah, I do. I, think I have it right here. Okay, there it is. So today, yeah, today we basically want to get through through chemistry in terms of talking about it. And then next week, we're going to go through the cells and the tissue. So if you're working on that, you're in good shape. And then after that, we do the first exam because that way, the exam then make sure that material you put aside and you don't have to worry about it anymore. So my tests are not cumulative. My tests are sectional. So they're pieces at a time. So the first test is going to be the um, introduction kind of thing, the chemistry, the cells, the small stuff that's not touchable kind of in a way from a visual perspective. And then the second part is all about muscles and bones. And then the third part is about everything else, the heart, the brain, and so we have some good time with that. And um, so what I want from you guys, and I'm just, what I want from you guys is, is, is any questions that are coming up in terms of the material. Do you have any of that? Or you're feeling like you're pretty good through, we're trying to look through chemistry type. No, I feel pretty good about it. It's, I like it a lot. Okay, good. Yes, and make sure you write that in my, my professor. <laughs> that way. All right, then I from that. Yeah, I was ahead. looking, I went to like ratemyprofessor.com, but I can't find for some reason your name. Oh, it might be M U E H. Oh, oh, okay, okay. Let me try. Because I'm from Switzerland, and so the umla, like in the German U, has a dots on top. And yeah. that and that umlaut translates into UE sometimes and sometimes into MUH. So it just, just depends what they do. And so all, actually in both of the colleges that I teach, they have me as MUH. Okay. If you can't find it, you know, just shoot me a text and I'll send you a link. I'm going to pull out, I'm pulling out the PowerPoint real quick. I got another class and we do all these muscles. So let me close these real quick. Yeah, of course, the car sale took a little longer than I thought. So I just got home. All right, so we got the first chapter and then the chemistry chapter. Good. Have you guys worked through the chemistry chapter yet in terms of the quiz? 
Is it for this week? Is it due on Sunday? I think it was due. Let me see. Well, the due dates are somewhat flexible, right? Yeah, chemistry was due last Sunday. Yeah, then I did. Because I okay. did all. Yeah. Okay, perfect. All right, so let me, and then the, what I want you guys to, uh, Hannah, are you there too? Yes, I'm here. Oh, good. I haven't heard you yet. But, you know, <laughs> the good, the good news about these classes at three o'clock is it's very intimate. We're very close to, we only a few people, so we can actually really get into the material. Then the other class at six, I'm, I think I'm going to have like 20 students or something. Um, and so make sure, you know, come prepared and, and pick my brain as much as you can pick my brain in those times. Um, whatever good is in that brain, you know. So what I see here, oops, let me see. You guys see my, I'm actually grading something, which there we go. Where is my whole modules? Do you guys see my canvas? Yeah, we do. All right, so what I want to attend, put your attention to is in the, the test. You can see that. I think on your canvas, you can see the test already. You can, yeah, you can't see anything after the test because we'll open that when the test is finished. So that way it's not too overwhelming when you just look at everything. And so in there, there is a test review. And when you open that, basically all you get is this link, this test review link. Have you, some of you guys been able to print that out? I haven't yet. Okay, so I want you, if you can, go print that out at some point because on there I basically go through everything. So what I want to do, you know, without the picture. So what I want to do today is go through the introduction chapter, the chemistry chapter of this test review. And that way I want you, give you the opportunity to, you know, ask me what you don't understand or make sure everything that will be on that exam is kind of covered in terms of, you know, we talking about it. That make, is that good? Yeah. And actually, you know, if you follow that, did you guys find the flashcard thing that I put in the big, in that little, those cards? Do you find that interesting? Useful? Yeah, I did. Good. So yeah, that's how I learned when I was, I don't know, 15 or something. I, in Switzerland, you have to learn French and the, English and all these different languages besides German and because it's a very small country. And so that was the system that I was given to learn French, that Leitner system, and just seems to make a lot of sense. And then I applied it in an atom in, in chiropractic school. And it was really very helpful in terms of organizing material and, and minimizing my maximizing my study time kind of thing. So that's why I want to share it with you. So these dots are actually excellent I think um, flashcard points that one could do if you want to make that flashcard thing. So when I start with the first chapter and, and the first test is basically the whole of all of chapter, all of the book one, booklet number one. And then the second is booklet number two and three. And then the third test is everything else. But don't worry, the, the third test is a lot of material, but I have a really detailed test review. That's I think on four pages that gives you everything you need to know for that exam. Um, so that way you can like really focus on learning the material and not be afraid of the test. That's another thing. You guys are, are afraid of tests. You can be honest. Yeah. <laughs> yes. Right. I know me too. And, and I had a lot of testing. That, when I took my first driver's license test, I got sick afterwards for a week. My system, my nervous system was so tense and then like, ah, because, you know, and in Switzerland, they're a little harsher than here because we don't need to drive. If there's a lot of tra public transport. And so they're like, oh, you don't know nothing. Oh, you're going to fail anyway. And it's like, oh, my God. And so, you know, I, 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 I think, you know, some of the tests that I do are definitely their college level tests, but I want to make sure you use it. It's, it's almost it's a learning experience. You know, I have plenty in that thing. You do the, you guys think the quizzes work? The way I work the material with that? You like that? Yes. yes. Yeah. You know, that gives you a lot of credit already. So that way, a lot of it is, 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 is busy, is busy work sort of thing. Um, yeah, it's really helpful too. Uh, what is helpful? 
like being able to like go back and redo it so like you know you get it right the second time and you're actually learning it instead of just like oh i got it wrong can move on next like it's like a learning experience that way right yeah exactly yeah yeah yeah. good that's my goal i know i i started doing those questions when i i was lecturing at married in oakland at the at college and 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 i was it seemed like the students didn't know what i was talking about and i'm like i'm done with this i don't feel like i want to do this teaching thing it's just too like, you know, I, it's not about the money. It's about the feeling. And so if the students don't know what I'm talking about, it's boring for me. And so I very selfish. And so I figured, let me make these questions. And it took a long time to make these questions, like for all the class, for all the uh, um, courses and, and sort of, you know, make the students do these before I teach. And so then they know what I'm talking about. And so that's sort of the morphication and, and then COVID happened. And so it was a perfect system for COVID. So anyway, I know I don't need to tap my own horn on that. So you go, you want to go to, you want to print that out, I think. And so then we I, have- I just printed it out. I'm going to go grab it really fast. Yeah, yeah, go ahead. Go ahead. I'll wait. Good. So the, the first thought there, you see, is anatomy studies body parts, physiology studies how the body functions. And so the, the body parts are really the things we can touch and we can name. And the function is like, how do we describe how the heart pumps blood through the body kind of question. So that's the difference between that um, thing. And then from there on, um, um, I actually have a booklet here. Afterwards, the next page pretty much starts talking about the levels of structural organization. And so that's kind of when you look at that is like from small to large. So to in the introduction chapter just talks about a lot of these terminology gives you an overview of everything. But then the next chapter is a chemical chapter. And so we start as small as we can start to explain how the body functions or how nature works, basically. And then from there, the next level up is the cellular level. Um, and that's the next chapter, the chapter three, I think, is, is, is what how the cells work. And the cells are the smallest units of life. So uh, COVID is a virus. That's not a cell. That's just a, a virus. It's just a, a, a DNA uh, structure basically in a, with a, with a cover with a shell and that stimulates the immune system uh, cells themselves are more bacteria those are cells um, and so we are made out of and so that a bacteria could be is a multi, is a unicellular organism very often so it's just a one cell thing uh, we are made out of trillion cells and I think I put an example in the book of how many trillion cells uh, is it's a large number so we talk about that. And then the last chapter in the booklet, number one, is about tissues. And so that's the, those are fabrics. Those are like, how are we made up besides the cells, like aggregates of cell, multiple cells coming together, they form a tissue. And then from there, we go to organs like the heart or like a muscle. And then we go to organ systems like the cardiovascular system, the heart and the blood vessels, for example, or the brain and the, the nerves, all of that combined in a system is then an organ system. And at the end, we combine those systems and we become an organism. And that's sort of how we se separate these different uh, organ, organ systems or, or, you know, the body. And, and so when we, what we look next is the organ systems. So we have an integumentary system. What well, you want to know, again, this is the test review. So this is what you want to know for the test. Now, the tests are open book. Because I don't believe, at least at this point, in these things like honor lock test observation things where they take a video of you. I take a class myself and I took a test with honor lock, which is one of the proctoring services. And it really stressed me out. So I, I, I and, and then I know at, at Merced, there, we don't use those anyway. And so what, though what we do is the tests are somewhat timed. Um, and I'm still working on that. Um, so what you want to have for the test, you want to have for this test, you want to have booklet one next to you and you want to have this test review back, to, back next to you. And, and that way you will really prepare, I think. 
So as we talk about uh, what I want you to know about the integumentary system is the fact that it is the, the skin. It's the external body covering. And the skin, what does it do? It protects the deeper tissues um, from injuries or from, you know, when you think about you banging into something, you don't get bleeding. You just get nothing really. It just hurts a little bit, but that's a nerve in the tissue, in the skin, but it's protecting it. You don't, you don't injure your tissues. You have that protection around it. And then a few other things that happen in the skin is we make vitamin D. That's why it's important to go outside actually. Uh, we can take vitamin D, but we also often get diminished in vitamin D because we're so much indoors these days. So the skin actually makes vitamin D and vitamin D is associated with a lot of body functions. That's one of those, that's one of those vitamins that, that medicine is starting to figure out how important it is. And it's, a, it's important from arthritis to cancer and all kinds of stuff. And so that's a, it's an important one. Some of, sometimes they start measuring that in the blood. What's the blood level? The skin also has nerve. And, and so this is important to go outside. So I told you that already. The skin also has nerve receptors. And so, yeah, when you, when you touch something hot, you're going to, you know, yank that arm away from it, uh, that heat, that's a reflex. But the nerve receptor inside the fingers is what actually triggers that reflex. And that was the negative feedback system that we talked about. That's really how it works. You have a receptor that picks up a stimulus. You have a afferent or sensory um, 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 connection that goes into the central nervous system and there you integrate what needs to happen and then you have a, a motor output uh, again that's a nerve that goes then to the effector and the effector does a thing and in terms of touching something hot and pulling it hand away that's then a muscle that pulls that away also skin has a lot of glands in it that's so you feel that when you sweat or also oil glands and so every hair on your skin has a has an oil gland going to it, and sometimes those get infected, and 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 that's when we notice them. Or sometimes when we don't wash a hair for a long time, it gets a little oily. So that's kind of that oil thing. So that's sort of the natural, um, the natural uh, lotion that we can think of that way. Then that so that's the integumentary system. So you see, it has a primary function, and then it has accessory sort of functions. Uh, the skeletal system is our bones and our bones what it does it protects organs you can think of the skull for example it also provides uh, sites for muscles to attach to and we talk largely when we talk about bones we talk about different landmarks on the bone different areas of the bone and a lot of what we talk about is what are areas that muscles attach to the bone because then they move the skeleton they move the bones around and actually that's how you move your arm around for example or your legs is by muscles contracting what muscles do is muscles shorten so that's their main function is to shorten and when they do that and they're attached to two bones then they bring up bones closer to one another and that's how movement happens in the body Another thing that's sort of an accessory structure that a skeletal system does, it makes blood cells. So all the red blood cells, all your immune white blood cells, everything in the blood on the cellular level is made inside the bones. So that's very interesting. And then I don't know if you heard of um, osteoporosis or a disease like those kind of things where the calcium gets leached out of the bone. So the, the bone has a lot of calcium in it that makes it hard. Uh, and so that like a, that's the brick part of the bone and um, the heart structure and and that calcium makes the bone hard, but it also is needed in the blood for many, many, many functions like a muscle contraction needs a lot of calcium like a nerve impulse needs calcium to function. And so the blood needs a very fine level. It can have too much or it can have too little, but it needs to be very maintained at a certain level of calcium. And the bones are perfect for that because they store all the calcium and then when needed, they can put it into the, into the bloodstream. So that's the skeletal system. The muscular system is what moves the body around. We talk about those muscles attached to bone. When they move, they move, but they can also contract and they maintain a posture in gravity. So if you're standing upright, the fact you're not falling down and collapsing is because you have muscles that maintain that posture. Even if you're not moving, you still have muscles to do that. Um, another thing is, is facial expression. So that's the muscles of your face are not attached to bones. They're attached to skin, a lot of them. 
and they help with facial expressions. And then the other thing bone does, I mean, muscle does when they contract, um, uh, you notice that you go out walking first, it's chilly and then it gets warmer. That's the muscles contracting produce a lot of heat. That's a side product. But of course the body uses that side product for its own benefit. Then the nervous system is the brain kind of stuff, the um, brain spinal cord, and that's a, a control system. The nervous system talks to all the other organs and cells and tells them what to do. And it's a fast acting system. So it's like a nerve. It's like an electricity thing going through the body. So if you ever hit your funny bone on the side and it, it shoots down to your pinky, that's a nerve firing. Um, the one system that also works with most body control is the endocrine system. And that works also is controlling the body, but it's not as fast. It's very slow, but it's longer acting. So the things that the nervous system controls are things like reactions. Like you're on the freeway and some stupid mm, cuts you off and you have to swerve out of the way. That's the nerve talking, that, the doing thing like that fast. When you then keep driving and all of a sudden you feel the jitters because it was a really almost bad one. I don't know if you know this, that or the same feeling when you have enough cough, too much coffee or something. You get the jitters. That's the hormones that go through the system. That's the adrenaline going through the system, that jittery thing. So that's the difference between the nervous system and the endocrine system where you can feel that. Um, the endocrine system is much slower, but it acts much longer. So a lot of things like growth, like metabolism, like making energy, that stuff is, is, is controlled by the endocrine system. The cardiovascular system, that's your heart. Your heart pumps the blood through the vessels. And then what that does, it transports oxygen to your tissues. And oxygen is what the lungs, the respiratory system is the lungs, it's what they pick up. So they bring oxygen from the air and in the alveoli of the lungs, you can see my um, thing, right? My test review? Yeah, we can. Okay, good. So you see where I'm wrote, what I'm talking about here? Yeah. Sure. Good. Whenever, if everything, at, at some point, if something's weird, you have to speak up because sometimes it, you know, I get it wrong with this or, or Zoom doesn't transfer it over. So anyway, the respiratory system is what, where we get the, the air brings the oxygen into the um, lungs into the alveoli, the small air sacs in the lungs. And then that's where the oxygen goes over to the blood. And then the cardiovascular system brings that oxygen to the cells in the body and the cells to, it also brings nutrients to the cells, which you may want to say here, new, new comma nutrients, et cetera. Um, um, and then those nutrients and the oxygen together make energy that the body then can use to move muscles around and things like that, or think. Have you noticed if you study for a few hours, you need to eat. Thinking causes, uses a lot of energy. So if studying, you know, if it's a little bit painful to study, that's just what it is. There is a little bit of that mm, associated with that. When you feel that thinking, understanding, trying to figure it out, pain a little bit, then you know your nerve in the head is growing. The nerves are physically growing. So it's really cool. We'll talk about that when we get to the brain. I have an exercise for that. So then the next system is the lymphatic system. So what happens when you heart pumps blood through the vessels and into the tissues, into the muscles and so forth, how the heck does the blood get back to the heart? Because it's got to go back to the heart so it can be pumped over again. Otherwise, you, your, your limbs will swell up and you get in, you know, edema. They call that edema when they swell up. And so... Some of that fluid that gets pumped out by the heart through the blood vessel is going to come back from the tissues to the veins. That's the blood vessels that carry the blood to the heart are called veins. The blood vessels that carry the, the blood out away from the heart, they're called arteries. And so that's where those, that terminology comes in. So the veins pick up a lot of the liquid and bring it back to the heart. But the lymphatic system is also here to pick up and help bring back fluid that has leaked and is bring it back to the heart. And so the, the veins in the cardiovascular system and the lymphatic system, they help each other doing that. The lymphatic system though is also part of the immune system. I don't know if you ever heard of somebody who had, you know, especially with cancer, we talk about the lymph nodes. Like if it's spread through the lymph nodes, then we have more of a problem with the cancer. We have to do more chemotherapy or take lymph nodes out. 
And so that's a part of the immune system. So the lymph nodes is, are, are aggregate or like, are like round structures that the, that, that that lymph goes through. And what's cool about it is the immune system really tightly controls that no foreign substance comes in. Um, but unfortunately, the negative is that the cancer can also spread through the lymphatic system if the lymph nodes get into the talking uh, in, from that perspective, unfortunately. All right, then the next system we have the respiratory we talked about, then we have the digestive system and that is digestion is the breakdown of food by chewing it and by putting chemicals on it, which, which are um, um, enzymes. Um, we talk about enzymes coming up and then they are made small enough that the, they can be absorbed into the bloodstream and then the bloodstream will deliver that digested food to the cells and in the cells together with the oxygen from the lungs, we can make energy. And so that's one of the main reasons for this food thing. We want to make get food to make energy. We do also eat food to get vitamins and minerals. Those are small little components that the body needs to really properly work. Um, but, um, um, but we also use food heavily to make energy. And then the urinary system is your, um, when you go pee, that's the bladder is attached, the kidneys and the bladder. And what the kidneys do is they clean the blood. So the blood goes through the kidneys and the kidneys filters, literally filters the blood and takes um, the stuff out that we don't want to have in the blood. So it cleans it. Um, and it also through that process by filtering the whole blood and having that um, it can regulate blood volume, how much blood is in, how much volume is in the blood. And so it can, you know, regulate, if you, if you drink a lot of water, like we're doing now, you will pee out more of the blood through the kidneys and the urinary system. So the blood volume is not increased. And so, but the water drinking is very helpful. That's one reason why we do it. The water drink is very helpful to clean the blood through the kidneys. And so, because you have more volume going through it. And it's clean volume. Also, um, also we, 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 we regulate electrolytes and we talk about electrolytes. Those are the charged molecules. You probably know about Gatorade, right? Um, or when you, when you lick your skin, when you sweat and it's a little salty and that salty is like in table salt. It's, it's, a, it's an ion. And if you have done the a chapter on chemistry, you know what an ion is, but we'll, we'll talk about it in a minute too um, and, and get more of that. But it, it regulates the electrolytes. Electrolytes are heavily uh, important for nerve impulse, for example. Many functions, but nerve impulse is one of them. And then the pH is, is acidity, how acidic or how basic is your, so like a lemon is very acidic or when you clean a mirror with ammonia, is a, what is uh, Ajax or so, that's like very basic. So you smell that ammonia. So that's the difference between those. And in the body, I'll talk about in the chemistry chapter, we want to keep that pH, that level of acidity at a very narrow range so the body functions properly. If it gets out of hand, that's a problem. And, and one thing you're learning here, you know, you're learning in anatomy and then also physiology, you're learning how the body functions properly and then later on you can learn about pathology and you can learn how what happens when it doesn't work quite right but then you know you have a baseline of how it's supposed to work um, okay that brings me to the last system that's the reproductive system and that makes sure our viability is there and we have offspring from there we go through necessary life functions survival and then into the homeostatic control and homeostasis so when we look at what do we need in terms of functions, what does the body need to do to be able to live? Well, we need boundaries. If we don't have a boundary, we're just all one thing. And that's just not going to fly that the body can't function that way. So we need boundaries. You know, fences make good neighbors kind of motive here. We need to be able to move or things need to be able to move through us. If we don't have that, how are we going to get the food if we can't move a hand around, for example? Or how does the food get to be absorbed into our bloodstream if there's no, um, you know, when the stomach is growling, that's muscle movement, right? When you hear that. So if, 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 the, if that doesn't work and the food doesn't move through the food tube, the digestive tract, what's, what's going to happen with us? We don't have energy. We, we need to be 
responsive. So what that happens is is the ideal is you know when uh, the uh, the good example is when you heat you, you touch something hot and you pull away. Um, that's responsive. So that's a nervous system. So the term irritability doesn't mean you're pissed off. It just means you're re reactive and you respond and react to stimuli. So that's a nervous system function. If you don't have that and you like twist your ankle and you don't feel that it's not a good thing to twist your ankle, you keep walking on that ankle, you're going to destroy that foot very, very fast. So it's very important that we have that. Digestion is the breaking down food and bringing the food into the cells, getting it to the cells. So that's important, uh, again, for then making ATP uh, or energy. And that's where we have the metabolism. Every chemical reaction inside your body is, called, is, is listed under metabolism. So when you say metabolism, you can also say chemical reactions, uh, like making energy or building muscle when you work out or things like that. That's metabolism. Excretion, well, guess what? If you can't pee or poop things out that don't belong in your body, not a good idea. I don't know if you've ever been constipated and you like you can't think straight after a while. And so um, that's why excretion is very important. We need, of course, reproduction because we need to make sure the cells produce, you know, uh, reproduce themselves, but also humans reproduce themselves so we don't just die out. And growth, if a baby, like, just think about if a, you know, a baby doesn't grow and then that gives baby to the next generation, we would have a Russian doll situation. Everything gets smaller and smaller. So we need to grow. Cells need to grow. Organisms need to grow. Um, um, and that's on the growth. So those are functions that the body needs. Now, what do we need to survive from the outside? We need food. I have a question. Sorry. Yes. No, no, okay. absolutely. Yeah, for interrupt me with those things. <laughs> okay, so for boundaries, do you mean like literally setting boundaries with like other people? No, I mean, that helps, I think. <laughs> that depends on who you are, of course. But more like boundaries in terms of having, having, having a cell membrane around it or having a skin on your system. Oh, okay. It's okay. not that emotional stuff. I mean, I'm obviously at some point that probably plays into it. But. <laughs> okay, so it's like actual physical boundaries, okay. Yeah, I'm looking at the physical boundaries, absolutely. Okay. Thank you. Mm -hmm, you're welcome. So, yeah, yeah, anytime, just interrupt. That way I just keep talking. If I ask you and nothing comes up, then, you know, it's all this empty space. Um, um, so be rude, please. Uh, survival needs is what do we need from the outside? We need food. We need oxygen. Again, those two together make energy, ATP. That's We can talk about ATP in a minute. But energy, that's very, very important. But then we need a normal body temperature. If we don't have a regular body temperature, if we have a fever, that changes things on the inside or how things work that speed things up. That's actually why we get a fever. So we try to push out bad bacteria or bad things that got into the body that maybe can't survive at a higher temperature. So that's the um, body wants to do that. <coughs> also, with increased body temperature, your metabolism goes high up, goes up. And so the body can produce, you know, be more productive that way for a moment to shed that illness. And then we need to have atmospheric pressure. The pressure is very important. If you go diving, you know that very, very fast, you feel the pressure coming from the outside. Or if you go really high up and climb a mountain of 12,000 feet, you go like, hi, the hell, I can't breathe anymore. That, you know, you get lightheaded. God, I'm talking too much. Sorry, I have to drink water and things while I'm talking. So those are the survival needs, what we need. And then the next step there is homeostasis. And homeostasis is a very important concept. The, it, bas it means that it's the ability of a body to maintain a relatively stable internal environment, even though the outside is changing all the time. That, if you relate that to body temperature, you want to be at a regular body temperature. If you're too high, you feel it. You've had a fever before. You better had a fever before. So your body knows what to do with, a, with, a, with an insult. So, so, so the, that's like homeostasis means if the fever, if, if your internal body temperature is without outside of a specific range, the whole inside of the body starts working less and less efficiently. So if your fever goes up to be too high, your, 
your body burns up the protein in your brain and, and that's not a good thing. And so that's why, for example, with kids, they actually now let kids have higher and higher fevers um, when you go to the emergency room with them and they spike them at a 104 or so, they, they don't even necessarily give a medication to bring it down. They more look like is the kid al alert or not because they also understand that a fever is a good thing to, 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 to shed uh, insults away from the body and get, get the bacteria out of the system. But we want to have the inside body temperature at a certain range and we sure don't feel comfortable if it's too high. The same is true for a blood calcium level. The same is true for a blood glucose level. For example, if your blood glucose level is consistently too high, that's the blood sugar, that's when we get diabetes, for example, over time. And so homeostasis is that ability for the body to maintain that stable internal environment of, of all these different uh, substances and things, uh, even though the outside is constantly changing. If you think about it, you go out in the morning, it's cold, but your inside body temperature is not going to change. That's going to stay the same. Or when it gets really hot in the summer, you're just sweating like crazy, but the inside body temperature is trying to stay as much the same as possible. So that's homeostasis. And how do we maintain homeostasis? By the negative feedback mechanism. And that means negative doesn't mean bad. Negative just means the opposite. It should say opposite feedback mechanism. So that means like if it's the temperature on the inside of the body gets too high, the body starts sweating because that brings the temperature down. And that's the opposite part. So if it's too high, we want it lowered. If it's too low, we want it higher. And we can apply that for anything, calcium levels in the blood, body temperature, you know, uh, blood sugar, all these uh, different things we're measuring. We can then, uh, you know, figure out how to adapt, how to, how to use that body to to create that opposite effect if it gets out of hand and so that's when we look at the homeostatic control system we look at a stimulus a stimulus can be you know prickling a finger and you don't want to be prickled so how are you going to pull that hand away while the stimulus is picked up by a receptor that goes up a, a sensory pathway sensory also means afferent so write that in there and then from there we go into a control center either in the spinal cord or in the brain. And then we have a, a efferent pathway or a motor pathway, that's the same thing, goes to an effector that has, has an effect on it. Like if you prickle your finger and you want to pull it away, that will be a muscle that pulls the finger away. And that pulling the finger away will be the response. Now you could, you could do that by measuring calcium levels inside the blood and you measure the calcium levels. It's like, whoa, the calcium levels is going too low or too high or what, well, you know, either or, but it's out of hand. So if it's too low, it picks it up. The receptor says, Hey, we got to do something about it. It sends a signal to the brain or spinal cord. And then the effector goes into the gland and actually stimulates the parathyroid gland that the calcium level will be brought up when we get some calcium coming out of the bone. And so the blocked calcium level is again in a narrow range that is allowable and that's the homeostasis. Does that make sense? Yeah, that makes sense. <laughs> Good. Now, uh, some things uh, happen with a positive feedback mechanism and mainly in our body as a, as a physiology uh, thing, we have, we have um, the milk let down. So if the baby suckles on the breast, then the milk slowly comes down and then you want it more producing because the baby's hungry. And so that's almost like the stimulus, the initial stimulus gets more and more intensified. It doesn't diminish, it doesn't go the opposite. And so that's why that's called positive feedback mechanism. So the temporarily intensifies the stimulus. And so the other one is when the baby is born because the uterus contracts and then it needs to be contracted more and more and more until the baby is born and then it can relax. Um, another example in the body would be when we cut ourselves and we bleed um, and the body needs to patch up a broken blood vessel. And that's also a, a stimulus that intensifies until the blood vessel is closed and then it can let go and, and, and stop doing that. All the other positive feedback mechanisms for are, are are pathologies, and so that you know what that really means is the more, the more, and the more. So a cancer wants to spread, wants to make more and more and more. So that's a pathology. 
And so that is kind of what works with positive feedback, positive feedback mechanisms. But the ones I mentioned, those three are, are um, physiologic processes in the body. All right. Again, no question, I'll move on here. Anatomical positions, that's the second part of that um, 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 chapter. Were you able to do that homework piece? I think so, right? I created a bunch of them. Um, actually, I needed help on the labeling exercise, if you don't mind. No, absolutely, talk to me. Um, it was part three where you have to talk about the positions like anterior, posterior. Those ones always trip me up. Okay, bring me example. I got to pull out my, my laugh thing here. Let's go through them. <laughs> where are they? Do you have specifics? I can't find it right now. Can you read them? Yeah, sure. Um, there's one, they're like fill in the blanks. Yeah, yeah. So one says the wrist is blank to the hand. Okay. And the answers are, they're probably distal and proximal, right? You have those answers? Yeah, I put proximal. Yes, that would be correct. Okay. So it's closer then, in the extremities. You use distal and proximal using the extremity. And so distal is further away from where the extremity is attached to. So an elbow is distal to the shoulder, but a shoulder is proximal to the elbow. Okay. So it's the same down here, right? Then. And then the next one is the kidneys are blank to the lungs. They're below the lungs, right? Mm -hmm. The kidneys, the lungs are up here, the kidneys are down here, so they're inferior to the lungs. Okay. And then the nose is blank to the cheekbones. So the nose is more towards the midline, right? Yes. So that will be, do we have that? Medial, right? Yes. yes. Okay. And then the chest is blank to the ab abdomen. So the, the belly is here, the chest is here, mm -hmm. is above, right? Okay. What is that? What would that be? Superior? Yes. There are more? Uh, there's three more or two more. Go for it. The trachea is blank to the spine. I and put anterior. Yes. Okay. And then the brain is blank to the spinal cord. Is it? Say it. I got superior. superior again. Which one? Superior? Yes. Oh, okay. You know, it's funny you're bringing that up because I remember being in this class early on, long, you know, a long time ago now. I'm old now. Mm -hmm. But I feel I felt the same ambiguity about this, I think. It was also a little confusing at first, but then it, it's one of those things that at some point it just became second nature. So I think by the end, does that, that make was sense? That the only part I needed. Yeah, it makes sense. Good, good. So yeah, any anytime something like that shows up, just if we don't have a Zoom, you know, since actually let's do this, since we're there. If we don't have a Zoom class, um, you can always text me. I, I try to be really there for you guys. So don't feel bad. Just text me and I'll get back to you guys. Okay. Um, my job is more like a coach than a teacher from that perspective. Um, and then also, uh, I mean the wrong thing. And then also what I did is I created a study group, Zoom study group. So here under Zoom or Zoom, see that here? You see my Zoom? Yeah. I mean, you see my canvas, canvas, see it says Zoom study group. If you click here, it goes to a room that I made on Zoom that's always open for you guys. See here, biology to study group room. It should just show up, see that? And then yeah, course, I don't want to open that now because I'm already on the Zoom with you guys. But so basically what you could do if you feel like, hey, I want to have a little study group with each other or something, 
you could meet in that place, in that space. It's always open for you guys to use. Um, and the other thing, of course, we could do is we could say like, hey, can I have some help, uh, teacher? And we can also go meet up there. But I started doing that and, and um, um, that might be helpful, okay? I know we're only four students here or three of you guys and me. It's a little bit funny, but you know, I want to make sure we utilize those and I can also be there um, working with you on it. God, it's hot in here. I'm sweating. All right. Let's go back to the test review. We have a few more. No, we did the anatomical position. That's stand up and palms forward. The reason why we do the palms forward is because if we, go the palms down or backwards, these forearm muscles, they cross over. And so that's why that is important. So if you know standing up and palms forward, you know the anatomical position. And the reason why that is important is because that's how we figure out how things are described towards one another. And so we can always describe everything in an anatomical position. And then it doesn't matter if you're laying weird or patient is weird laying there and you don't know how to say certain things. So that's just one to remember. And of course, look at that, no regional terms. So what you do with that, you just go through those regional terms a few times and, and, and know, you know, what's the common, you know, know what they mean, basically. That's most, so if you have a question with those, shoot, you know, interrupt me. Um, and then we have those terms we just did, superior means above, inferior means below, anterior means in front, posterior means behind. Medial is closer to the midline, lateral is further away from the midline. And then in the extremities, we have proximal closer to the attachment, a uh, trunk attachment, distal is further away from it. Um, those are the main ones. In the palm, we also have supination, um, pronation, but we'll get to that later. Let me not mess with that. Um, then from there, we go to the second chapter and that's chemistry. And so that's a, a, a fairly big chapter because it covers the inorganic, sort of the basic understandings, and then also the chemistry of life. How does the body work? So uh, let's go through that and make sure you stop me if it's too fast or too complex. So the first two terms you have here is matter. Matter occupies space and has weight. So anything that you can touch is matter. Energy is what changes matter and puts it into motion. So um, that moves energy around. So if you move a table around, the table is matter. What you, the energy you put in to move it around is energy. So that the effort you put in. And so there then we have, uh, when we look at energy, we can have potential energy and that's stored energy. That's in our little, you know, COVID-20 pack we got around the waist these days. Um, apparently most, many people <laughs> have that. So that's potential energy. That's energy in a battery that we created, but we haven't used yet, so to speak. And kinetic energy is the active energy. That's the move, movement of the energy. So if we walk around, and you guys did great in that exercise and the understanding concepts. If you walk around, you're moving, that's kinetic energy. And then what is lost when we do that, or when we have any energy conversion, is heat, heat usually gets lost. So we can easily convert energy from one form to the other, but we lose heat in doing so. And of course, in the body, we can, you know, harvest that heat by, you know, look at the muscle contraction as a side product creates heat. So you're not cold when you're walking outside. So that's, it's not, it, it says lost here, but you know, the body can make use of it. Okay, then from there, we go into the building of, of, of the chemicals. And so when we build chemicals, the first thing we look at is the smallest form a chemical comes in. And the smallest form a chemical comes in is an atom. And so those are the building blocks of all matter. And so when we look at an atom, it's kind of like the solar system. You look at protons and neutrons, that's the core, the centerpiece. And then you look at electrons and those are um, little particles or actually only energy, depending on who you ask on what model you look at. And they float around that nucleus that is made of the protons and the neutrons. You can visual, can you visualize that solar system? Nope. Wait, can you repeat the question again? Uh, can you visualize the atom, this, the little co core um, center with the electrons floating around it? 
Oh, like the model of it? Yeah, yeah. Just in your head, since you're talking about that. I want, because I'm building on that. I want to make sure Yeah. Got, you guys got that. You... So the protons no, that are... Thing, that thing. Yeah. Okay. You got that? So we have the protons and the neutrons in the middle, in the core. And then around in the core, what we float around is the electrons. So that, that's so good. So, so good. Huh? So far, so good. Yes. Okay, because that's an atom. And so when we look at then molecules, molecules are, 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 are multiple atoms put together. That's a molecule. So like, for example, water is hydrogen atoms and oxygen atoms put together, and that makes water, H2O. Because from there, what is important then is a, is a bond. And, uh, you know, how do we make these molecules? How do we make these atoms want to come together and, and hold on to each other and not just split apart again and, you know, just bump into each other? And that's where we get into these bonds. And, and we need to understand that chemical thing a little bit more when we get into bonds. So number one, bonds happen between electrons. So bonds don't happen in between the center of atoms. Bonds happen between these outside, you know, like in a solar system, those would be the planets. It happens to between the planets of different atoms. So the electrons of different atoms. And so when we further look into that, when you look at uh, the electrons around the core, the center, they come in different orbits and orbits are shells. So this is like, you know, Mars versus Earth versus Pluto, all these different pathways that these electrons float into in, in around that core. And, and those are orbits. And when we then go to the next term, and so bonds, these things that make atoms stick to one another happen in these electrons, actually in the outermost shell, an outermost orbit of these electrons. And so that orbit, that outermost shell is known as the valence. And the valence in most atoms likes to have eight electrons in it for some reason. So they call that the octet rule. Octet means eight, the rule of eight. So if that outside shell of an electron has eight in them, eight electrons in them, it's known, it's happy. It's all satisfied. It's not a problem with it. It's not vibrating weird that it wants um, to to, to interact with something else. But if it doesn't have those eight in them, it becomes reactive. And so the inert elements are these here, helium, neon, argon, krypton, xenon, right? You don't need to study all of that. Just you have a list here in case you need to look it up. But those are inert elements. Those are the ones that have those eight electrons in the outer shell. And so they're non-reactive. All the other ones interact. They want to have a, an interaction. They're not quite, those outside electrons are not quite happy. And so they can interact in two different forms or actually three, but we're really talking about two mainly. Um, one is when one of these electrons goes in to, from one atom to the other atom over and it jumps. And so that's an ionic bond. So that's a transfer of an electron. The other bond is when these electrons on the outside of this atom and the outside of this atom, they start holding hands kind of thing. They're sharing the electron. And then that's known as a covalent bond. So there we have an ionic bond and a covalent bond. These are what makes our table salt, for example, our electrolytes. And then these are like our sugar molecules, our fat molecules, our amino acids and those so forth. So the covalent bond shares the electron. Now, water is a covalently bonded molecule, so it's very stable that way. When we look at the covalently bonded molecules, though, we have some that come like water. They come in what's known as a polar form, polar covalent molecules, because the distribution, the sharing of the electrons is not even. So the hydrogen, the, the oxygen, H2O, the oxygen here uses, has a bigger pull on the electron than the hydrogen. So the hydrogen side is a little more positive and the oxygen side is a little more negative. It's like the magnet on a fridge. You know, you put the magnet on a fridge, one side versus the other side. You think of that polarity like that. Some of the molecules that are covalently bonded are non-polar. So all of the, uh, you know, the bonds and the electrons and the 
nuclei, they all share equally. And so that would be ethane, for example. But the thing, the, 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 the cool thing about the water molecule is that it's, it's not it's not balanced that way. So it creates these tension lines between the positive and the negative pole. And we can use that and create a water lattice. And that's known as a hydrogen bond. So on the surface of a lake, you see some of these um, 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 insects, they, they can walk on the water. So the tension the water has, they're, they're not heavy enough that they can actually, don't, they don't break through that tension. And that tension is what that attraction between positive and negative poles are. These are all different water molecules that are, see the, the positive of the poles attract to the negative side a little bit. And so they form that um, bond and that's known as a hydrogen bond. And we use that in our body, for example, when we make proteins and, 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 and you know, different attractions in a, in a chain of amino acids form different structures. We'll talk about that when we get to protein. We probably get to that today. So that's a hydrogen bond and also the ionic bond um, so far. Does that make sense so far? Getting a little bit lost or you're all right? I'm doing good. You're doing good? So you're, follow you're following what I'm talking about? Yeah. That's most important because actually I switched from the test review to the chapter, because I think that is an important piece. So if we go back to the test review, we are, let me go back to the test review real quick. The slides that um, you're looking over right now, are those accessible? Those are books, that's in the book. Oh, okay, okay. That should be, the book is probably a little more modern than some of the slides are, but it's basically the same thing. Okay, got it. Um, so yeah, we talked about atoms a little. We talked about molecules, bonds, valence, octet rule, ionic bond, covalent bond, hydrogen bond. Look at that, we went all the way there. Now we're gonna get to organic molecules. So, so when we look at organic versus inorganic molecules, organic are the life. When you see organic, you're thinking of a lot of carbon, a lot of carbon containing things, large molecules. And those make our us up life kind of thing. And so we talk about those, but we also talk about smaller inorganic molecules. So let's go through some of those. So if you if you look at water, that H2O thing, that's the most abundant inorganic molecule in the body. Let me show that on the picture. You have that in your book, I think. If you take all the body apart and you separate it this much of your whole body volume will be water. And everything else is like, you know, powdery stuff that you have to mix together with water that it works. So that's pretty profound if you think about it. So that's actually one reason why we do that water drinking exercise because most of us are dehydrated because the two quarts are actually just the replenishment of water we lose on a regular day um, through sweat and peeing out and all that. I mean, we eat some water too in the food. So that definitely helps, but. Generally speaking, we don't drink enough water. So what is the, why is water so friggin' cool? Well, it has a high heat capacity. That means it can absorb and release a large amount of energy before it changes its temperature much. Well, guess what? The body on the inside, we want to have a per, sort of a temperature that's the same the whole time. So that's perfect for that. And you see that if you go to the coast here in California, the temperature doesn't change as much as inland where we are. Yeah, it's much hotter, much faster, much colder much faster where there's no body of water around. Then the other thing that's cool, it's got this polarity. That's, we talked about that. It's a non-polar covalent bond. So that gives it a lot of solvent properties. You can dissolve a lot of things in water and you know that you make tea, you make coffee. That's, that's that stuff that's solvent properties as a chemical property. So you can extract things with the water out of other things. So that's cool. Chemical reactivity, it's, it's almost necessary in all, pretty much all chemical reactions inside the body. And that's partly again, because it's got this polarity to it. Um, and then we got the cushioning and water can be trapped for, well, you feel it when you jump, when you're in a pool of water, you're, the gravity is completely suspended or almost completely suspended. And so in the brain, you have that too. You have actually a fine layer of water liquid around the brain 
that then makes the brain be suspended in liquids, in, in water. So it's like you were floating in the pool. So it doesn't collapse on the gravity because gravity is this force going down. As you notice next, you know, when you fall down or so, that's gravity. And so that's one cool thing of the cushioning. Also, of course, um, uh, the, the water, the liquid disperses um, 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 cushions below, for example. So it's protective that way um, as well. So that's the cushioning. Or you have, for example, a lot of trapped water in, in fat, in a fat layer around the, um, the kidneys, or you have it in, in, in joints as well. Like the, the cartilage of joints has a lot of liquid trapped in it. And so that's the cushioning. Then salts are the things in the body that are ionically bonded. So what happens with them, what's interesting, these are the, these are the ionically bonded molecules that we have. So there's sodium, chloride, uh, magnesium, calcium, and potassium. We use them for nerve impulses, for example, because they are charged. So they're like electricity. So the nerve impulse is like electricity going through the body. So that's why you know, it's good to use those uh, charged molecules. And the thing is, salts, when you look at an ionic bond and you have a table salt, that's an ionically bond sodium chloride molecule. So that's a sodium and a chloride. And you put that in the water, it dissolves. You could do that when you put salt in the water, it dissolves. It doesn't look white the whole time. And so ionically bonded molecules dissolve and split apart into their respective atoms when you put it in water. And so what happens though with that is they, they have a charge with them. Because like sodium, for example, in the chloride, sodium chloride, sodium loses an electron and chloride gains an electron in that process. And so therefore chloride becomes negatively charged and sodium positive because the, 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 the nuclear an atom is positively charged and the shell part, the electrons are negatively charged. So if sodium loses an electron, so as a net charge, the, the, the nucleus is a little stronger than the shell around it. So it becomes positive. And so that becomes then an electrolyte solution. So salts dissociate in water into their atoms and the ions are the atoms that are charged. So ions are charged atoms, basically electrically charged atoms. And that's what makes an electrolyte solution. And that's what you drink when you drink Gatorade, except there's a lot of sugar with it to make it taste real good. But it's because otherwise it'd be more salty tasting electrolyte solutions by themselves. But they figured out Gatorade uh, as an electrolyte solution when the Miami, Miami, Miami Dolphins, I think it was in the 70s, they would, uh, they would train in Miami where it's really hot and humid and they would get exhausted. And so at some point they drank this salty electrolyte solution and they had much more energy. So here you see the energy levels drop as you become dehydrated. And of course that's water, but it's also electrolyte because you, you're sweating out salt, you're sweating out electrolytes. Whew. Does that make sense? Come on. Yes. Because now we get to one more level up and that's the acids and the bases. And uh, yeah, if you need to take a break and have a sip, just do that. I do that right now. I haven't taught this class in nine weeks, so it's gonna be a bit of a speeding on Zolus, but you guys are doing great. I think it's totally doable. So the next topic and is acid and bases. Make sure I have this test to you here. Acid and bases. So that's a bit of an interesting topic, acids and bases, because basically what happens is acid, if you put acids in a solution, like if you put salt, lemon juice in water, you will have hydrogen ions that get released from the lemon juice, from the acid into the liquid. And the same is true for bases, but what they release in, the, in, in, in liquid is hydroxyl ions and those are OH ions. I don't need you to worry about that term hydroxyl. Hydrogen is kind of cool, you know, because the H is the hydrogen atom. And so when you look at those two though, acids and bases combined, this is water, see that? It's back to disturbing the water. So if we have heavy acids, like really strong acids, they release a lot of hydrogen ions in the liquid and that disturbs our pH and that disturbs our water balance in the system. Sort of, you know, the, 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 the 
the amount of hydrogens and the amount of OHs are in there. And so um, that's where acids and bases become dangerous because they change that concentration of hydrogen ions or of these OHs, these hydroxyl ions. And so when we look at the body function, that's then the pH. The pH is actually a value that's um, inversely proportional to the acid. So what it measures, it measures the concentration of OH. And so we inversely have then the concentration of hydrogen. So a low number, a zero is very strong acid. And a 14, a higher number is a very strong base. That's all that means when it says inversely expressed. So don't, you know, that's what you need to know about that. Zero is a strong acid, 14 is a strong base, seven is neutral. If the body fluids, the blood so, and so forth, do differ, go deviate away from that pH, which should be 7.2 in the body. If it goes to 7.4 already, you already have functional differences in the body. So we already get from a normal in you know, acidosis or alkalosis, for example. And look at that. If it goes too far, if it goes too far below 7, you die. If it goes too far below 7.8 pH, you die. Like 11 is 0.2, it's a two. I mean, this is like nothing. This very narrow range. You can only move around in. And, and we get into that problem, for example, with diabetes, when we have a problem where we can't, uh, we can't control that um, hydrogen ion release well enough and, and the acids and bases. And so that's where that becomes a problem. Um, and we have multiple systems in the, in the body that balances out these hydrogen ions and these hydroxyl ions. So we have the main one is bicarbonate ions and, and carbonic acid. So we can take bicarbonate and ions um, and that's like an alka or so because that's for stomach acid to absorb stomach acid. That's also an acid, stomach acid, if you have heartburn or something like that. So the bicarbonate ion absorbs a lot of these acids, a lot of these protons, these hydrogen ions and makes a carbonic acid out of that. And then it brings that to the lungs and we breathe out. Um, we breathe out the acid, so to speak. And then it goes back and circulates in the body. So that's kind of cool. So acids and bases, what you want to know about that. Um, when we go back to the list to make sure, because that's a little bit of a more challenging topic. Uh, acids are substances that release hydrogen ions when in water, which is in the body. Bases release hydroxyl, the OHs. I don't even spell that out there. As strong acids or bases are toxic for the body, the pH measures the concentration, ion concentration. One is or zero, or one is a strong acid, seven is neutral, 14 is a strong base. The buffers are weak acids and bases. That's that bicarbonate. And that then picks up excessive hydrogen ions or OHs to balance out the body pH. There's the bicarbonate. All right. If you have no questions, look, we got a little more going and then we can close it out. I know. The second part of the class is not as me just talky. Well, we see how that goes, but generally speaking, um, it's a bit more interactive because we then start talking about muscles and bones and so forth. So hang with me. So we'll get through the organic chemistry. So that's the second part. So when we look at the first thing that we need to talk about monomers and polymers. And so um, when we look at a monomer, a monomer is a single unit of a larger unit and that's a polymer. So uh, if you, ha you have a single unit in the simplest form and then in the polymer, it just gets repeated. And so we have that in many uh, aspects. For example, in a protein, wherever the proteins are, in a protein, these all, these little beads are all amino acids. And these then are connected together. So if you have one of them, it's just amino acid. If you connect them together, then it becomes from a monomer, the single unit to a polymer which is a multiple unit, but they're all amino acids. So they're repeated forms of it. And so what we need to talk about chemically speaking is how the heck we make these monomers and polymers. And so when we wanna make a multiple units out of one unit, 
um, I mean, out of single units, we want to connect them together. What we do is we have a process called dehydration synthesis. So synthesis means we're building something, synthesizing. Dehydration means we're dehydrating. It's like we're thirsty. Dehydration, you're dehydrated. That means you haven't drinking enough water yet. So you're thirsty. And so what happens in reality is you have to break some bonds and see, take away some of the molecules out of the two monomers to make a bond and bond them together. And what had happens to be that you extract out of the monomers is water. And so you dehydrate, you squeeze water out of the monomers, so to speak, to bond them together and make a polymer out of it. And when you do the reverse, you basically add water to the polymer to these two monomers and they split up and become monomers again. Like you do that, you know, you build blocks and then you have to destroy them. Like you eat a sandwich, you have to break all those little sugary bread things down to get, you know, disaccharides that then the system can take it in and small enough that the bloodstream can pick it up. So that, ter that is called hydrolysis. So lysis is a term that means separate. So basically you need to add a water molecule, the hyd hydro is water. Uh, you need a hydro, I mean, a water molecule to lyse, to separate the polymer into two monomers. Yeah, I know, trying to make this chemical thing as visual as possible. So that's the, um, then the other terminology that comes up there on your uh, term, on your list is hydrophilic and hydrophobic. That's afterwards. You see that? That's on the review list. And so let me see. See here the term hydrophilic. So philic means loving, phobic means fearing. And so you have like, if you, for example, you can visualize that when you make salad dressing and you put oil and vinegar together, the, they never like each other. They always separate. You have to shake it and then you put it on salad real fast so you don't just get oil or something like I have to do that. Um, and so oil Vinegar is like water. That's like wine or, you know, original. And so that's watery stuff. Oil is a different substance. And so if a substance like liquidy, like carbohydrates, uh, can dissolve in water, like sugar dissolves in water, we know that molecule to be hydrophilic, water-loving. And so what chemically, what that means is that the water the molecule of like a carbohydrates has a very same ratio between oxygen and hydrogen that the water has. And that's why it dissolves in water well. Oil does not have that. So chemically, you see the carbon here, that's carbon, carbon, carbon. And you have these water things attached to it, these hydrogens and these hydro hydroxyl uh, uh, molecules. Um, and that basically is the same ratio as oxygen and hydrogen. If you look at oil, You basically, in oil, you have a lot of carbon, carbon, carbon with a few with hydrogens attached to. You have very few oxygens. So that ratio between how many car, how many hydrogens you have and how many oxygens you have in that one molecule is completely different than the water. It's not a two to one ratio. It's like a completely different ratio. And so that's why oil separates out from water and that makes it hydrophobic. And phobic means fear. So the only molecule that we have to worry about is like water, is oil like that. So oil is hydrophobic and carbohydrates as well as then proteins um, are hydrophilic. And now you know why they are hydrophilic. So that's important because in the body, a lot of things happen because of that quality of being hydrophobic or hydrophilic, which makes sense. If you think about it, we said up to here is water. So everything we do in the body has liquid around it and with it. That's why we want to drink water. It's like, you know, originally we came out of the ocean and we just kind of put a skin suit on top and the water is on the inside and we're still kind of in the ocean. That's how I visualize that. So when we get to carbohydrates, carbohydrates are the sugar rings um, and uh, uh, they're great for energy. That's, you want to know that. They come in monosaccharides and we have these three monosaccharides we worry about is the glucose, the fructose and the galactose. Mono means one single carbon ring. And then when we combine them, we make disaccharides. And disaccharides, di means two. So you have multiples ones, and these are the ones we eat. So you have a cane sugar, 
that's the sugar we eat. That's a sucrose right here. So that's a glucose and a fructose. And what's interesting is the glucose gives us energy. The fructose make it taste sweet. Because you also have malt sugar, maltose, and OSC. If you see the word OSC at the end, that's the sugar in chemical terminology. So maltose is a glucose in the glucose, and maltose does not taste sweet, but it's a lot of energy. And then you probably also know the term some people you know yourself are lactose intolerant. That's because lactose is our milk sugar, milk sugar, lactose. And that has a galactose in the glucose. And the galactose, if we don't have an enzyme that can break that down, it's going to not know the body, don't know what to do with it. And it blows us up and gives us stomach pains. Um, if you have bad lactose intolerance, you know what I'm talking about. And so that's the dissect, right? And then when we go further and we are, what happens is we eat these things and breads and yummies, and then the body breaks them down into these smaller structures, then, then the bloodstream picks them up. And then we go into the cells. And in some cells, like the muscle, the liver, and sometimes also in the brain, we want to store a little bit of glucose. And so the inside of the cell, we can attach these ring sugar, these sugar rings to the sugar rings to the sugar rings and make these long um, chains. And TRC, we have this glycogen. And in the body for us, that's glycogen is a polysaccharide that we can store some sugar in the body that way. Cellulose is in the plant. We're not going to eat that. Starch, we can't absorb that. But glycogen is a storage that we can have. And so when we need energy quickly, we can chop up some sugar, put it in the bloodstream, go to the cells, and with oxygen, we can make some fast sugar out of it. And that means, I mean, some fast energy out of it. And that's, you know, helps you keep running. So that's good. Glycogen is in the humans. All right. After that, I think we can go to the lipids. And the lipids are fats. And they're mainly large carbon containing um, um, uh, 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 chains of molecules or large carbon containing molecules. The big one that we look at, um, we have a few that we actually look at three of them, but the first one is our regular fat, what we think of as fat when we think of fat. And that's our triglycerol or our neutral fat. And the way that chemically that's built, it's got this o OL at all glycerol. That means it's an alcohol, chemically speaking. It doesn't mean it's got alcohol and it just is that chemical structure. Um, and, and that's a backbone. So that's this looking structure. Then out of that backbone come these fatty acid chains out of it. And fatty acid chains are basically carbon after carbon after carbon after carbon with some hydrogens attached to. So that's why and the structure of a, a, a neutral fat, a triglyceride, looks like an E structure kind of thing. And so that's kind of the way that works. And so what's interesting here is a couple of things. I have to go back to the chemical bonds, the covalent bonds. Let me go back to the covalent bonds real quick. Because you can have... Oh, I don't show that. No, I show it over here. You can see that. I don't think you have that in your picture. You might have the small one. But you can have some molecules, they have the two electrons from one of each of those atoms, electron they share with each other. And so that's called a single bond. You can also have more than one each sharing. So we can have double bonds or triple bonds even, they call those. And so what's interesting, if you have a single bond, it's like a one rod, it's like a one axis that both of these molecules, they, both of these atoms can rotate around it, whatever they like, however they like to rotate. Once you have a double bond, those molecules cannot rotate anymore. They're stuck in that position. And so when you translate that into the fats, you see all these single dashes. This it just means there's more in between. These single dashes, those are single bonds. So if you have two hydrogens attached to an, a, a carbon, you know it's going to be a single bond. You sometimes have some that are not single bonds. See the indication here, these double um, dashes going up with the oxygen, that's a double bond. So these molecules can rotate freely around themselves. And what that means is when you look at 
at saturated fats, they can, these are all single bonds. They can freely just rotate and pack themselves as tightly as possible. And so that makes them very dense because they can do that. Uh, because if they have a double bond in between, they cannot do that. This here cannot rotate. So if this uh, carbon chain, this fatty acid is stuck in this position, it's going to be stuck in this position. So you're going to have some room in here, some space. And so that's not as densely packed. And the difference is we're going to get fats, the saturated fats that are solid at room temperature, if room temperature is 70, not if it gets too hot, your butter will melt. But that contrasts to an olive oil. That is, unless you put it in the fridge, it's going to be liquid. And the liquid means it's not as densely packed. And so it has some room to, to go in between the molecule and that makes it liquid. Isn't that kind of cool? Or did you ever wonder why that butter is more solid than oil? Probably not, right? No. I know, I didn't either. <laughs> <laughs> And so, so these, you know, so, so this is the difference between saturated and unsaturated fats. And then we go into, you know, the omega threes. You heard of the omega threes, the fish oils that we should eat more of. Uh, yeah, I have. You have, right? That has to do with where are the kinks? Where are these double bonds? Mm -hmm. So it's very, it becomes very interesting. It becomes very fast, very relevant. Um, and that's also why trans fats are so bad. That's a question on the understanding concepts. And trans fats are extremely bad because the way that this configuration is, this kink is natural. In a trans fat, what we do is we unkink that so we can make an oil into a fat, so we can make margarine. And the unkinking process is not a natural process and it's sort of stuck in a form that the body can't recognize. So it's it becomes, they talk about cis configuration and configuration you have to worry about that it gets too too involved but just in case you go further in this study but i thought that saturated and unsaturated explanation is pretty freaking cool that's what i thought so from there that's our main fat stuff you do the prostaglandin yourself did you ever see that kind of stuff you got a pancake sausage with chocolate chip that's a lot of trans fats. So we'll talk, I talk in the video a little bit about the trans fats. Um, you don't have to worry about those for the tests. That's more of an FYI for the test. But where we go pick it up for the test is the phospholipids. So now we're leaving the regular fat. Now we're getting into functional fats, not fat for just mostly energy storage or protection. Now we're getting into things that we can use in the body for function. And the phospholipids is fantastic for that because if you visualize, you had the, this fat was the, the E with the backbone and two things coming out. Now in the phospholipid, instead of three, I mean, three things, instead of three things coming out of that backbone, you have two things coming out. And then one thing, so this is the glycerol backbone. These are the fatty acids. And then you have only two of them. And on the other side, you have this whole other chemical thing. And it's called a, uh, a phosphate containing uh, molecule because it has a phosphate in it. But the cool thing about it is this part reacts like fat. So it, in the oil and vinegar, it dissolves out of water. It doesn't like water, it rejects, repulses water. This is like water. And so now we have a molecule that on one side, it acts like water. On the other side, it acts like oil. And so we call that um, the, the water part, the hydrophilic head. That looks like a head to those people. Hydrophilic, hydro means loving water. And then the other side is the tails, those things sticking out, they call it the hydrophobic tails. And what we do is we take two rows of those and have the hydrophilic part sticking out and the hydrophobic part touching each other. And we create an oil film in liquid with that. And so we can use that as a cell membrane or as a membrane of any kind, we want to transport things in that are fatty, or we want to make a boundary in a liquid environment. Remember, up to the armpits, we're pretty much water. And so we, create, we can use that oil and water rejection, repulsion energy, and make oil films around, and that becomes our cell membrane. 
and so it's nice and fluid and and can be pinched off and so it's it's flexible in that way but it's also firm enough to create that physical boundary that we need to be able to survive to make us viable and another thing that's really cool here and i think i have it in a booklet somewhere um Acid, that the, the omega threes are really important in here because that depends on how straight that these tails on are depends on how fluid that this membrane is and then when you look at brain function that depends on how fluid it is but also how well it can communicate the cells can communicate with each other so when you when you look at cell logic in the cell the the brain of the cells really the outside shell is the communication center uh, they communicate through the cell membrane. So anyway, that's way far down. That was like, we learned some of that was brand new research in chiropractic school when I went there. So that's really cool though. But that's the reason why the phospholipids are so awesome. Um, and then from there, so that's the phospholipids. So if you have a question on that, make sure you speak up because then it brings me to the third type of fat and that's cholesterol, that's the steroids. And that's a flat. That looks completely different than that E thing we had. Um, and you don't need to really know how it looks, but just make, you know, understand it looks different. It's different from the fat molecules. But in the body, we have a lot of fat-based important things like vitamin D is fat-based. The sex hormones are fat-based. Aldosterone, cortisol, there's some other molecules that are fat-based. And the fundamental of that is cholesterol. And so that's kind of interesting because we always think cholesterol is a bad thing, right? And so we got to be careful. Cholesterol is a challenging thing, but it's also a thing that we need to survive in the body. It's just a matter of how much and what kind of cholesterol. And so we often talk about HDL and LDL in our, when we look at the blood panel or so, and HDL is high density lipoprotein. That's what it stands for. And those are fat little globules that bring fat back to the liver for processing. So they are called good cholesterol Whereas the LDL distributes the fat molecules from the liver to the body, and those are known as bad cholesterol. So when you look at your blood panel, you want to look at those two different numbers and see which one, and then you have total cholesterol. But that's where, functionally speaking, the cholesterol, what I want you to understand is it is the steroid, the main steroid building block molecule that we then use to make vitamin D, sex hormone, and more of those things, cholesterol, cortisol, and so forth. All right, that brings me to proteins. Look at all the stuff proteins do. So proteins are really cool. Proteins are um, uh, construction material in the body. So your muscles are proteins. Uh, you need protein stuff in your bones. Uh, it provides work for the body. Your enzymes are protein. Your antibodies. If you get the vaccine, what the vaccine makes it makes antibodies against the COVID thing and so that's protein basically so when we look at the structure of a protein we're looking at well first of all it's again like like sugary stuff like carbohydrates it's dissolvable in water so it's hydrophilic we have 20 different amino acids and the amino acids are those little beads those are the building blocks to make protein so every protein is just a chain of amino acids. And that's very, very important. It's a chain of amino acids. And so we have 20 different of these amino acids and each amino acid looks like this, all the same. And then you have one group part of the molecule that's a variant. And so we got all these different names. You don't have to study these names. You just know they are existing. And 20 of those make all the proteins we need in our body, all of them. Eight of those 20 are known as essential. That means the body cannot make them, so we have to eat them. So that's when you are a fully vegan person, you need to make sure you match your proteins because the animal protein is a complete protein. Vegetable protein is not a complete protein. It is always, there's some missing in it. So you need to make sure you match the foods properly uh, so you're not having a deficit of anything at some point. Because if we don't have one of the essentials, you can make a different protein that you need to make because you're missing one of the links. That might be a problem, depending on what it is. What's also important here, because when we get to the genetic uh, discussion, the DNA, 
that is. The DNA is really designed, you know, that's in the cell nucleus, that double helix thing. That's like, oh, it's genetic, that kind of thing. All I inherited, why do you have brown eyes and blue hair kind of thing? That's all a cookbook. The whole genetic code is a cookbook for making amino acid chains, for making proteins. So that's very important because when we go down to the bottom of understanding how we make, how we use the DNA and how we make proteins, then that fundamental understanding is very important. Anywho, when we look at, so we go back to the protein. When we look at the proteins, we have multiple structures. So the first structure, the primary, is just a sequence of amino acids. Then you got a secondary structure. And the secondary structure is when that, you know, there's these different hydrogen bonds, attractions inside of those amino acids. And so they, 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 they are attracted to one another. And so they can come in to either a, a arcodian-like sheath, the pleated sheath, they call that, like looks like an accordion, or sort of a telephone, you know, old telephone cable. I know cell phones, hmm. old telephone cable wrapped up cord that you can make longer. So that's a, a alpha helix or a beta pleated sheet. So that's a secondary structure. And then a tertiary structure is within those within those wiggles and sheath. There is more um, convoluted wiggling happening and different attractions within the amino acid chain. And one thing you need to understand, especially when we get to antibodies, for example, or enzymes, proteins are very shape dependent. You've noticed that when people talk about the COVID, they talk about the spikes on the outside shell, right? And then the amino acid that we, I mean, the antibody that we need to create is we need to somehow neutralize those spikes. And so the spikes on the COVID are, are antigens. So they're parts of the virus that can create that can trigger the immune system and make us sick so to speak what we want in an antibody is 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 an antibody that can recognize physically and shape that antigen that spike and then it can neutralize it and so that's where so it's 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 it is physically shape dependent so i want to make sure to because it's all kind of voodoo when it's that small to me you know i have to but it is, I have a really good video on booklet number one. Let me see. Where was that? I got to look at it. Your language shapes. And yeah. Ah, we got, I got a, oh, I think animations of unseen biology. The booklet in the, the, the have you checked out these tech, these TED things in the back? I haven't looked at them yet. So if you get, you know, bored of this anatomy stuff, you just go through one of those in the back because they're inspired. Those are my most favorite TED Talks in the back. And one of them down here in the middle, it literally shows a cartoon-like understanding of how biology looks in a cell. And, and it's, as, as it's, it's not cartoon-like, it's, you know, Mickey Mouse cartoon. It's really visualizing how it really looks, but it, it becomes a cartoon, basically. It's really cool. You can really see how physical that structure is. So that um, that's for that. And so then when we go further in the protein, we have two different main types in our body. One is more like a structural protein. So you're thinking of like your tendons, like, you know, by your heel, the Achilles tendon back there that holds the whole calf muscle into the bone. That's a, funct a structural protein so or fibrous protein. So that's mostly fiber. So the collagen is a fibrous, or, or also in your skin, you have a protein called keratin inside the skin cells and that hardens the skin or makes the hair and the nails waterproof. And, and so those are structural proteins. They're very hardy. You cannot really destroy them with light or heat and all that stuff. Then you got the other type, the functional proteins, and those are easily destroyed. You can visualize that when you put an, you cook an egg you put the egg into the pan and make the sunny side up. First, it's, you know, the egg white is not white, it's clear, and then it becomes white. And so what happens in that process, the heat is denaturing, destroying the protein, the albumin in the egg. And so you can see how easily those are destroyed. Um, and so globular proteins are things like antibodies, things like hormones or enzymes as well. While fibrous proteins are the tendons and the ligaments and things like that. A brief moment on enzymes, because they are definitely the cool things. Enzymes are, go back to thinking of a disaccharide, a sugar molecule, two glucose together. 
you gonna have this bond between those sugar monosaccharides to make a disaccharide. So you can have an enzyme that has a shape. And again, it's a physical shape that's shaped like this maltose disaccharide and you can bring it in. And on that enzyme is a site, an active site called here that will destroy that bond and will clip it. And then both glucoses will be released into the space and the enzyme you can reuse for the next maltose coming in and doing that same process. And what that does by destroying or making bonds, you don't have to rely that bonds are made or destroyed just by nature, by things happening to bump into each other. So you can organize your metabolism that way. And, and when you look technically what they call that, is they call that process of chewing up the bond. And so you think of it like an enzyme could destroy an albumin easier or a heat can do it. But the heat is kind of like an enzyme in that way. But we can't have all this different heat in the body. So we created the enzyme. And it destroys, it, it decreases what's known as the activation energy. So a chemical process is like it needs to have extra energy to get started. And once it's moving, it goes forward and it gets completed. And that's what that activation energy is. And so an enzyme, technically speaking, lowers the activation energy that those chemical processes can happen much easier. Enzymes, so enzymes are heck of important. And, and you can recognize an enzyme when you look at the uh, suffix ASC. That's pretty much always an enzyme. Not every enzyme has to have the suffix ASC, but if it has, a, a word has that suffix, you can kind of count on it being an enzyme. And then some enzymes, like for example, enzymes that in the stomach that destroy proteins, you might not want them always working because they could destroy your own, your own stomach wall, uh, you know, if they're always active, if there's no food around. So some enzymes come in an inactive precursor form. That means it's a form that's not quite functioning yet. And they call that gen. So if you see the suffix G-E-N, like from Genesis, uh, the creation, you know it's not quite an active enzyme. So in the stomach, we have a pepsinogen. And then when it combines with stomach acid, it becomes pepsin. And then that's one that doesn't have an ASC, but it's an enzyme. And then a pepsin will destroy or de, um, um, break apart protein. That's where you have protein um, digestion. Cool, enzymes good. Last two things here. You guys are really, look at all that time you're spending with me. I'm sorry if I put you to sleep. Um, the last two things are the first is nucleic acid and the nucleic acid is our GNA, our hereditary material, our, they call it the blueprint of life. And it's, so it holds our genes. And so what it really is though, what genes really are, each gene is a recipe for one protein. So it's a cookbook of proteins. All the DNA is a cookbook of proteins. And so that's inside of our cell nucleus in the core center of a cell, like the dark part when you look at a cell. And that's the, usually the center because it's most protected. Because if you destroy the DNA and we alter that, and you know, that's why we put on sunscreen and all that stuff to protect the DNA. Because if you destroy that, then it's harder for the cell to make the proteins. Can't make the proteins right. And so that, so the cookbook then, what happens with the DNA, the DNA, let's say you need to make a protein, the DNA copies the part, the gene that makes a specific protein, and that becomes RNA. So it's just a little slightly different, but it basically is, for us, it's a copy of the DNA. And then we can add that, go and make the protein, because that has to go into outside of the cell nucleus, and make a protein inside the bar, bigger part of the cell, which is much more dangerous and it can get damaged. And then that uh, makes the protein. And so the important parts of the DNA or anti-RNA molecules are what they call nucleotides. And so nucleotides are the active portions of this double helix. You see this double helix. So these are the rungs in the ladder, these nucleotides. And so we have four, we actually have five of them, but we have four we use in DNA, and we have one that then gets exchanged from the DNA to the RNA. And so we have, look at these, we have adenine, guanine, cytosine, and thiamine. 
And these are the ones in the DNA. And these are, look, they call them purines and pyrimidines. You don't have to worry about that. That's a deeper level of discussion in a chemistry thing, organic chemistry class. But the thing that's important is, is they pair together. And so you have, you have a purine pairs together with the pyridimine, pyridimine, no, pyrimidine, anyway. So yeah, don't say that word too often. So what you don't have though, the pairing is adenine goes together with thiamine. So adenine is paired up with thiamine and guanine with cytosine. So you have them from each side of the double helix, they come towards the center and form part of that um, latter part uh, uh, of the double helix. And when we make proteins, what we do is we split them apart and then you have basically a strand with one after the other, after the other of these nucleotides. And then that becomes a code to ultimately which one in sequence shows up. Is it an adenine and a guanine or an adenine and a cytosine, thymine? What's the sequence? And that sequence depends on what protein we're going to make, what amino acid we're going to work for and look at. And so that might have been a little much right there, but that's essentially in your cell chapter, the protein synthesis. So we'll get to that next week. Um, what you need to know for now is which are pairing up, adenine and thiazine and guanine and, and, and no, adenine and thymine and guanine and cytosine. So I, I always remember A, T, and T. I don't like that phone company, but it works for me to remember A, T goes together and then the other ones are the other ones. Actually, the other ones I remember because they're rounded letters, but that's just my goofy brain doing that. I mean, I have to study them. You don't have to study these names. You just have to be able to pick them out on a test. Okay. Um, and then, and then when, so we have these four for DNA and when we get to RNA, one of them splits. So instead of a thiamine in RNA, you replace that with a uracil. Same thing. It's just, for us, it's the same thing. It's just a different name, but we can recognize that whatever sequence of the strand, if there is an U in it, a uracil in it, we know it's an RNA, not a DNA molecule. And make sure you understand that a little bit because that's on the test. With that, last topic, adenosine triphosphate, ATP. That's our energy molecule. That's our gasoline that we can use ATP and run around and we use ATP doing some. What part of ATP do we use? We use a bond. We use, oops, that last bond right here. So ATP, let me back up. Adenosine, that's the front part. We don't worry about that. That's an amino acid thing. That means it has triphosphate. And that means it has three phosphates attached to it. And so the last phosphate of the three, these bonds have energy in it. The last bond has a lot of energy in it. So if we split that phosphate off, we get a lot of energy. And that's what we can use to you know, power a muscle. And then we have, uh, as a result, we have an ADP and a phosphate left. And so in the body, we're going to then have to reattach that phosphate to the ADP and make an ATP out of it. And that takes oxygen and of course, um, also um, 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 glucose and stuff like that, of nutrients. Um, and so here you have another one. So we have a lot of energy here in the third phosphate, and then we have some energy that can be released from the second bond. So if you have, you know, no ATPs left, you could take an ADP and get some energy out of that ADP. But then we have an AMP, and that's an adenosine monophosphate with only one on it, and that's not much energy left, just a little bit. All right, so good. Whew, that was a lot of talking. Are you still around with me? Yes. <laughs> You're kind of getting that or is that too much? It was a lot, but I, I understood it for the most part. Okay, cool. So that way, you know, we have it down in a format. If you understand it, then we're, that's a good start for where we need to be. Um, if questions come up, make sure to shoot me as a text or, mm -hmm. or, you know, make sure you don't just stay in the space of not understanding it. Um, it's very important for me, you know, that because then we can build on that. Okay. I don't want you to feel, and I don't want you to feel like, in, you know, not understanding it um, as much as I can help. And if you feel like making study groups, then, you know, if you can't connect with each other because you don't have each other's number, 
um, shoot me a text, say, I want to make a study group, and then we slowly create something and I'll connect you with each other. I put my phone number in the chat if Crystal or Hannah, if you guys ever wanted to do that, you guys, if my number's right there. Oh, cool. Okay, thank you. I put it in my phone. Okay, perfect. Super. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's, that's excellent. Especially when we come to the second session, when it's a lot about muscles and bones and we like, where's what, which, and blah, blah. We test each other and that, you know, that becomes very, very handy. And again, if you guys, if you guys want, you know, a, a, a study session where I'm there, you just shoot me a text and we'll figure it out. Um, I'm usually, usually go before 7 p.m. and then I go to bed. <laughs> yeah. Then I close it out. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah. And then I'm back up early, but I could do as early as six in the morning most days. So <laughs> but I don't know if you guys are up for that. Oh yeah. I don't <laughs> morning. Free coffee, right? <laughs> All right. Well, with that, for my end, um, the lifestyle's going all right for you. I think most of you guys are participating in some of that. That's good. Um, and I think for next week, if you guys do the food label analysis a little bit, then we can talk a little about that next week. Sounds good. All right. Any uh, last thoughts? No. Thank you. Yeah, thank, thank you. you so much. You're so welcome. Thank you. Yeah. Bye, you guys. Bye. Bye. Have a good day. You too. Bye-bye. Thank you.